nice and tidy we keep this here. Um, we're all here tonight and I'm particularly delighted to welcome uh, Ben. A lot of you know him and either through his writing or personally, um, so I don't need to say too much in terms of introducing him to you. Um, he's, uh, we're claiming him as a native and I think we're probably on fairly firm ground doing that. Um, I've been trying to get him here through various bits of communication for a while now, going back before COVID. Um, and then he unfortunately threw himself off a, a racing bike at one stage to avoid having to do a, a, an event for the last book he had out. But having recovered, I wasn't going to let him off this time. Um, he's here tonight to talk about his, his new book, Storm Crow, which is a Viking epic set in these parts, uh, Anagas and more particularly, but we're, we're claiming it again. So we're going to have an event. Ben will talk, um, introduce the book, give a bit of background to it. After that, there'll be a reasonably short um, Q&A session, anybody who wants to ask a question. And then after that, we'll have signings of the book up towards the front of the shop. So um, I'll hand you over now. Assume you're here to he see, not me. And would you all please give a warm Dundalk welcome <laughs> for Ben Kane. Uh, if you'd asked me when I was in the Marist for 10 years, I would ever be standing in here giving a talk to so many people, I wouldn't have believed you. So um, thank you very much for coming. It's lovely to see so many people and, and so many familiar faces uh, as well. So um, I give a lot of talks. Uh, every uh, This is my 19th book, and I give, it, give talks every year on the new book. And it's usually all about the history. But because of, we're here in Dundalk, and this is you know I grew up in the area, I'm going to do just a little bit of a backstory because you hopefully find it interesting um, and it's a, a sort of a, some of the path of how I came to be a writer. So uh, you may not or may not know I was born in Africa and we moved back here when I was seven and we used to live in the AIB because my aunt Rosemary and my uncle Jim, um, he was the manager of AIB so we stayed there because we didn't have a house and then my parents bought a house in Castle Bellingham and I went to the Marist um, and my parents were like, we're not having a TV because um, nobody had a TV when they left in the 60s and they came back and everybody did in the 70s and, and they said everybody just sits there. So we had no TV. So of course I used to go around to all my friends' houses to watch TV because I wanted one. But because we had no TV and I liked reading, um, I, I lived in the local library. So the, where, not where it is now, but where, where it used to be. Um, and back in the 80s, you were only allowed two books every two weeks. So I joined under my middle name because I didn't check. I said it was for my brother, and then I joined the mobile library as well. So I used to read four to six books a week, and by the age of 12, I'd moved down to the adult library uh, because I'd read everything. So I was reading Wilbur Smith and Westerns and, and Bernard Cornwell, uh, voracious appetite fantasy and historical fiction. Um, that's what I used to look like, moving quickly on. Um, <laughs> my dad's a vet, and um, yeah, good, good, that's fine. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, it's there. Oh, that's my dog Fred, bless him. So my dad's a vet, and uh, but he, he's in the department, so I didn't know what it was like to be a vet on call, and I read too many James Harriet books. Uh, younger generation might not know, this was a British vet who wrote tons of books that sold tens of millions of copies around the world. They were beautiful, charming stories. It was made into a TV series, and many, many, many people became vets because of it. And I thought that it was, it was all sunshine and roses. So I, I went to veterinary, um, again, moving quickly on. Um, and you know, when you're a vet, people say, oh, do you stick your hand up cow's backsides? And you get asked that so many times. I, I used to say, yeah, it's a nice warm place on a cold winter's morning. Um, and most people don't have a comeback to that. Um, it's, it's a brutal job though. Some of you may be farmers or from farming families or, or vets. Uh, you know, it's a tough old job. He never does this at home, they say, when the dog is about to take your hand off. Um, it's a great, great job, um, but it is tough. And uh, there's the proof that I was a vet. Uh, but by 97, I had, I really had a wanderlust um, all my life. Maybe it was because I was born in Africa, I don't know. But in 97, I, I'd read this book um, by this fella, Colin Thubron, and I took it in my head to follow some of the ancient Silk Road, which was various routes to Europe from China, lots of different ways. 
And on my own, I went to Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Western China, and then back into Pakistan. And um, in the desert in Turkmenistan, I visited this. You've probably never heard of Merv. It had a million people population in the 1200s. London was 2,000 or 5,000. Dublin would have been 1,000 or whatever. A million people. And it was literally sacked and burnt to the ground by the Mongols. And they killed everybody. Actually, everybody. Um, that's all that's left on the walls. But bizarrely, in my lonely planet, back in the days when people still used those, there was this one line about Roman soldiers that had been taken prisoner in a battle in Turkey and ended up here. And this was, you know, a thousand miles from the easternmost limit of the Roman Empire. And I thought, this is nuts. This is, it can't be right. But it was. Um, and that's actually the, the root of my first novel. Um, the most incredible sites, uh, people selling, there's a market in Western China where people, you can buy camels, horses, goats, guns, groceries, pottery, you name it. <laughs> Uh, there, there's a camel for sale. You can test ride a camel. Um, this is one of the 10th highest mountains in the world, Nanga Parbat in Pakistan. Um, this is not Cross Maglen in 1987. <laughs> um, this is Dara Adam Khel, a town in northwest frontier province where you give the guy a dollar and he takes you out the back and hands you an AK and you get to go <laughs> for 60p. Um, I was going to buy a pen gun. The pen guns were £1.50. Uh, 32 caliber um, and the guy from the hotel who was with me he said no 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 don't take that and I said I'm not buying bullets I'll just buy the gun he said no no customs in Karachi they really he was right they took my backpack to pieces it took half an hour to take my backpack so I'm just very glad I didn't have a, a gun uh, I went to South America for a year I went to Antarctica I worked in Australia I worked in New Zealand I backpacked in in South America climb didn't climb that tried to um, <laughs> Came back in 2001, literally just before foot and mouth hit. And actually, you're in the only part of Ireland. You all know how badly it hit Cooley, and my dad was doing it. But I, I volunteered because I'd actually seen foot and mouth disease. And I ended up in Northumberland, which is way up where Hadrian's Wall is, up near Scotland. It was, it was horrific. I did it for a year. We were, we were, well, if you heard the radio show this morning, mm -hmm. we were killing seven days a week. Um, and I ended up with PTS. And now I've never drunk so much in my life, actually. <laughs> uh, but I visited lots of Roman sites that I'd always dreamed about. And uh, Northumberland is pure countryside, uh, just like Cooley or whatever. So where, where the Romans were and all their forts is still literally there's nothing there only walls and sheep and a few cattle so it's very easy to imagine what it might have been like and i decided then i wanted to write a, a book about the romans um i was going to do the vikings but um if you know bernard cornwell the lost the last kingdom on tv load ten, tens of 50 books his first utrid novel which is about the vikings came out when I was thinking of doing Vikings, because obviously the Vikings have way more to do with Ireland than the Romans who never got here. Um, and I, was, I remember standing in uh, Newcastle upon Tyne, looking in the window of the Waterstones, and it was full of Bernard Cornwell's first Utrid novel. And I literally said, that fucking bastard. <laughs> because I thought, sorry, that, 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 that meant I couldn't write about the Vikings, when in fact, that's not true. It's, uh, you all know, like vampire fiction goes boof, uh, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, boof. Certain uh, whatever topics get popular, publishers all jump on board, but I didn't know that. So I went, right, I have to write about the Romans. Um, I didn't, of course, because ordinary life got in the way and I moved to Shropshire. I was a small animal vet. I bought a house um, and it wasn't until um, the worst night on call I ever had when I actually smashed my pager. It was in such a rage because I'd been called out seven times in one evening and it was never when I was in the surgery. It was always when I was nearly home. And of course, I picked up the pager and the screen was shattered and I couldn't see the number to ring for whoever's dog or cat was sick. So I had to ring about 12 different numbers going, hello, this is the vet. Did you just... <laughs> Long story, I came home one o'clock in the morning. I said, I opened my laptop and I said out loud, I am not going to be a vet by the time I'm 40. I was 33. Um, so I, I worked about 100 hours a week from the age of about... 36, literally 40, 50 hours a week as a vet, 40, 50 hours writing a week. I got a book deal. That's my first book. Um, and, you know, 19 books, 15 languages. Um, and finally, 
I decided I wanted to write about the Vikings because I did so many on the Romans. Um, I, I thought, you know, I've got enough of a name now. Plus, Vikings have been on TV, and it doesn't really matter if they're in Ireland. 75% of my readers are in Britain, you see. So I was always a little bit worried if I did something purely Irish, it might not sell. And a bit like bands, you're only as good as your last book. If your book doesn't sell really well, publish, you know, I'm, I'm just, a, my books are just a commodity. My, my editor is lovely, and I get on really well with her, but my books have to make her money, or she doesn't want to publish the next one. So, but Vikings are always good, um, and so... There, there were pretty fearsome people. Uh, you did not want to visit. That's a round tower in the background. Um, they were mainly traders. Um, so not all Norsemen were Vikings. We'll just make that plain to start. People from Scandinavia, from Norway, Denmark and Sweden, not Finland. Uh, they were <coughs> Norse. And they raided the Swedes to the east, down into Russia and Constantinople the Norwegians and the Danes to Ireland and England and northern France. And um, all Vikings were Norsemen, but not all Norsemen were Vikings. So, that you know, plenty of them weren't warriors. Uh, Vikings, um, but the name has sort of become ubiquitous. And they had a huge impact on Ireland. So they, they started raiding the north and the east coast of Ireland in the um, ninth century, uh, early ninth century. And indeed... The, um, the documents that survive, which are all written by monks, um, as so many of the things from that time are, um, record that the number of monasteries in this area of Ireland shrank down to almost nothing in the 800s because, you know, monks, uh, A, are, you know, this, they, 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 they serve God, B, they're unarmed, C, they've got gold chalices and silver in their churches. So, <laughs> and D, uh, a monastery, I don't know whether you know this, but a, like Monaster Boys, for example, near Dunlear, the wall around the monastery is only that high because it just it was like a sort of psychological thing was we live in here and the non-monks live out there. So it wasn't even defended. Um, so they were particularly easy to attack. And by the, the late... Um, uh, ninth century there were almost no monasteries left um, ar around Eastern Ireland and quite deep inland because of course Viking boats are quite shallow um, they, they don't need a lot of water so they could go up the rivers as well as, as you all know uh, so um, that's the only accurate Viking helmet you put your hand your fingers in your ears because your helmet's acceptable but that's the only <laughs> accurate Viking helmet that has actually ever been found they didn't ever have horns you probably all know that and these are all putative um, because of similar peoples that had things. But that's the only definite one that we have. They wore trousers. They used to wrap their legs like you can see there. If they had money, they had a male shirt. And I know well from walking Hadrian's Wall in Roman gear, you know, my ma Roman male shirt's short sleeved and it goes to my waist and it weighs 10 kilos. Vikings often wore them down to their knees with long sleeves. So they, wore, they were up to 20 kilos in, in weight. Um, and they sailed in ships like this, as you probably know, um, varying in size. They could have as few as 20, 24 men on board, up to maybe 50, 60 rowers. Um, so they could be carrying an awful lot of warriors, very, very dangerous. And they were, they were fearless sailors. Um, they, they sailed, as you probably know again, all the way to America. There's actually proof mm. there's a Viking colony in Canada. Um, so they discovered Iceland, discovered, there were indigenous people there, but for Europe, they discovered Iceland, they discovered Greenland, they even sailed all the way around, raided through um, uh, the Mediterranean, some of them went on crusade in the 10 hundreds and then on the way back, um, raided all the way back and very few of them made it because the Spanish were waiting for them. But let's get back down to the local interest, so it's really lovely, I hadn't realised, um, the, the gentleman to the right there is Michal McKeown who was... Um, very sadly not with us but he was a local man who worked in carol's factory i believe and uh, when he retired he was a, a, a very talented sculptor and artist but his, he had a great passion for history uh, so when i was growing up i had no idea that there was a viking settlement in anagassan which is about 4k south of castle bellingham on the coast little small village uh, near between um not far from salter's town if you know that beach and, um, but there, there was some uh, knowledge of this Viking settlement on the east coast of Ireland between Carlingford and Dublin. And it was occupied or, uh, or lived in between 
the in the ninth century basically and then the irish got sick of them and they drove them out and then about 20 or 30 years later the vikings came back this is all from historical documents but nobody knew where it was uh, now there were some people who had theories that it might have been in anagasan but no one had ever looked for it uh, properly until Mihal decided to so i'm trying to remember how i found out about this uh because i remember there was a viking festival in anagasan a few years ago do you know, I can't remember, but anyway, um, it might have been the internet, but somebody must have told me about Michal Mikyo. Maybe it was my mum or dad. Apologies if I've forgotten. <laughs> but I, I looked him up, I, and it was a little bit tricky, but I found him through his website for his, uh, his sculpture. And I sent him an email, and he emailed me back, and then he gave me his phone number, and I rang him up, and I told him that I wanted to, to set my book about the Vikings in Anagassan because I'd wanted to write one about Ireland and when I heard there was a settlement in Anagassan well he has to be from Anagassan and um, so he me was we had a couple of long long phone calls and he, he promised that he would actually walk me over the the uh, the ground because he knows the local farmers and he's been he's been looking uh, in this area for uh, many years but I believe in 2005 was the first time they went to to look for the settlement and I'll explain it to you. Don't worry if you can't read any of the writing. This is the sea. This is the River Glide. That's Anagassan village. And there's the bridge. Um, and so Vikings, because they were obviously raiders and they, they lived in ships, they had to be able to get away quickly. So when they formed uh, or set up a camp, they liked to be surrounded on three sides by water. And on the fourth side, they could build a wall so they could get into their ships and get away quickly if they needed. So the river glide is like, a fi is like a fish hook here. You can see there, like that, that bit there. And so Michal w decided, thought it would be pretty logical that they might have used this area of land as, as a, a settlement. And so uh, uh, over the course of a number of years, I believe in 2010, 11, they, they managed to get um, some sponsorship or some money together and they used ground radar um, the Lider, I think it's called. And this is blue line here is the rampart. They went to look for where he thought the rampart was and they found it the first time they used the ground <laughs> radar. Now, if you know anything about archaeology, you know that you can spend your entire career looking for something and never find it. And you might find something once and it, and it changes your life. Well, to, to find an historical site that nobody knows where it really is the first time you do something, it's absolutely astonishing. Um, and so it must have been in incredible for him. And uh, long story short, um, uh, so I checked with Roland. I, I didn't know you were going to be here. I used some of his dad's images because um, he was a very talented artist, as you can see. Uh, this is a, an image of them coming ashore, maybe. Um, and this, again, don't worry if you can't read the writing, but basically that's the river and that's the sea. They divided up the ground into grids and then they started looking. And what was also interesting, he knew he knew he was, I think Mion knew he was probably on to a good, a good chance of success because the River Glide ha, had been dredged on average every 50 years. Um, uh, and they used to throw the spoil into the fields here. And he knew from walking those fields that you could just pick up a Viking nail or a Viking comb. So he'd already found stuff that was Viking lying on the ground, not even not even underground. So they started using their ground radar. The blue hatching is low density. The black dots are where they found things. So just going bing, 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 bing. And what they what they showed really quickly was that this was an enormous Viking site. I believe it's um, uh, 50 hectares. Does that sound about right? Like well over 100 acres. It's 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 approaching the size of Viking Dublin and it has never been excavated so it's absolutely amazing it's all farmland still bar a couple of houses here and there so unlike Dublin which is completely built over older members of the audience will remember Wood Quay and they just built on top of it here is potentially an incredibly large Viking site unlike anywhere else in Europe really um, that that hasn't been excavated um, again long story short um, that's maybe what it looked like. So um, they were able to bring ships almost definitely in the river mouth because the reason um, Carlingford and Dundalk didn't work is because of the ocean currents were too strong. So they needed a safe place for their ships um, when there was a storm or bad weather. So they were able to bring them in here. And there's your rampart there. Um, that's what 
that's what it looked like. They worked out from their from their excavations. And there's one of Mihal's um, paintings of what it might have looked like. So by the time of my novel, it was abandoned. I, my novel set in the late 990s. Um, but I, I, I thought it was reasonable to say that there might well have been Hiberno Norse, because one of the things the Vikings did was they came from Norway, they came from Denmark, and they were called the Fingal and the Dovgal, the fair, the fair foreigners and the dark foreigners. But they intermingled extensively with the Irish. So by, by the time of Brian Baru, who's in this mm -hmm. book, you had Hiberno Norse, you had New Norse coming in, um, and you had um, Irish kings with, with Norsemen and Hiberno Norsemen fighting on against each other. So, for example, the Battle of Clontarf was not the Irish against the Vikings. There were Vikings on both sides of that battle, um, and they didn't leave after the battle. Like I, I remember being taught that that was him throwing them out of Ireland. It's not true. So there's an amazing archaeological park down in um, Wexford, in Ferry Carrig, uh, this is the Viking area, so this is a Viking longhouse. This is what they, they would have looked like, and it was suitably Irish. It was pouring rain, um, and there's a boathouse with a small, a small boat in there. Um, and that brings me to, to, to the book. So a lot of you have, have... Oh, sorry, skipped a slide. A lot of you... Well, you'll all know about Lord of the Rings, obviously, um, and that Gandalf was called Stormcrow. By, um, by the riders of Rohirrim, and I was a huge Lord of the Rings fan from this age. Um, and the raven was a very sacred bird to the Vikings. Odin had two ravens, one called Hunan and the other called Mugen, which means thought and memory. And um, if a raven landed on a body or a raven came near you, you know, it would have been hugely significant. And it's sort of a bit of a, 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 a homage to J.R.R. Tolkien to call it Stormcrow. I hope he wouldn't mind. Um, <laughs> So I decided to call the book Stormcrow, and I wanted, uh, uh, my books are, I write about battles and killing a lot, but I do huge amounts of research on society and religion and attitudes to things and the flora and the fauna, and I try and make my worlds as full as possible. Um, and I also try to have characters who could be um, one side or the other. So I had a half Norse, half Irish uh, young lad from Anagassan in this book. And he, um, and I realized it's, so, it's funny the way, um, if, you ever, if you ever write a journal or if you ever write a novel, the way things from your life feed into your books. When I was 14, we were at Salterstown and a body was washed in while we were there swimming. It's the first dead body I ever saw. Um, it, was a, it was a man and I can still vividly remember him. And I'm sure that's the reason I've opened the book. Until I did it, the book opens with this boy finding a body on the beach. Um, and the, the body, it's a warrior who's been killed. He's fallen off a ship and he has a sword. And swords were the weapons of the wealthy um, right through history. Most Vikings would have had a spear or an axe or a couple of axes. You, you often didn't have a sword. So this was, this was somebody with money. And uh, he's very drawn to the sword and he wants to take it. But there's a raven on the body. Uh, and most Vikings wouldn't, if you were if you were a pagan, which this lad is. Most most people were Christian by then, Vikings and Irish, but he's still a pagan, and he, he doesn't want to he doesn't want to um, go near the the body because of the raven. But he really wants the sword, so he he says to the raven in his head, "If you if if you're Odin's raven, and uh, if you let me take the sword, I will serve Odin." And the raven hops off the body. <laughs> and let and let him take the sword. I know, I know, I know. But you know, you gotta make you gotta you gotta make up these things. So he takes the sword, and um, he's got a friend, uh, and the friend is a shaman. And so another thing I've tried to do in this book uh, is to challenge people's ideas about Vikings. So for about ten years now, I, I I find an academic in the period that I'm writing about, and I contact them, and I always say. I will pay you as much as you want to charge me if you will read my book, please, before it goes to print and tell me the boo-boos. You know, because when it goes to print and there's a mistake, you get bad Amazon reviews and emails. Didn't you know such and such? <laughs> They're called rivet counters to do with World War II. So, for example, um, you write a book about the Battle of Britain and you get an email that goes, didn't you know there were 493 rivets on the underside of that part of the wing, not 300 and... <laughs> that, honestly, there are emails like that. <laughs> um, anyway, 
So I contacted Professor Neil Price. So he's the historical consultant for Vikings. He's also the professor of archaeology in Uppsala University in Sweden. He's British, but he is one of the most famous Rome. Um, oh, sorry, you didn't have many books I've written about Rome. <laughs> most famous Viking archaeologists in the world, Norse archaeologists. And I contacted him, and he very generously said he'd read the book. And it's two of his books that it helped me to shape this novel um, because shaman or magicians uh, for pagan vikings were generally women but they were sometimes men and if they were men they were gay and they were really really looked down on by by norse society so generally all the words that describe them are very derogatory uh, whether it's from the sagas that's generally the sources we have for the vikings are the sagas that have survived from a few from norway and most a lot of them from iceland um, but interestingly, what I, what I and I love, oh, right, this is this is going to work really well. Is the attitude to gays among the Irish of the time was it more liberal? Now we don't have very much documentation from Ireland of that time, and it's generally all from monks. But there are several kings who are mentioned in this period who had male companions who lived with them for many years, and we can suppose reasonably that they, because they had children as well, they were married with children, but that this companions were mentioned that they were perhaps gay so I, I have this this gay shaman character is the best friend of this of the hero um and he's he's half irish half norse as well um and and it, the irish don't mind them but the the norsemen the norsemen do and i'm not going to give away too much of the story um mm -hmm. but his father ends up, um, the hero Finn, his father ends up murdered and he wants to get revenge because he wasn't there when his father was, was mortally injured. And he goes for revenge to the, uh, the Cranog of the High King. Now you all know Cranog was one of those um, little fortresses, uh, they're tiny, um, on, a, on an artificial island in a lake. So if you know, great place to go if you're being attacked. You just go onto your island. You've got a, a collapsible rope bridge that goes down into the water or whatever, or you have boats and your enemy can't get you. This is in Ferry Carrig, and there's generally only room on them. They're probably only maybe 50, 60 meters across. There's only room for two or three houses and probably you know your cattle and sheep. Um, but the High King of Ireland at the time, his name was Mael Ishechnel. Um, he was the King of Meath and the High King. Meath was tiny. Uh, he was actually not that powerful at all. He wasn't nearly as powerful as the King of Leinster and, for example, Brian Baru, the King of Munster. But he was the High King and he lived on a... There was a fort um, on the side of Loch Ennell near Mullingar and um, there was also a Cranog. So this is where the, the hero goes. And unsurprisingly, because it's relatively early on in the, in the novel, he doesn't, get, he doesn't get revenge because it would have been only this thick. Um, and so... Long story short, but he ends up in Viking Dublin, and Dublin was tiny. I mean, Dublin was probably only um, three, four thousand people at the time, and um, you may well know um, Dublin means black, uh, black pool, and that comes from this. So there's a tiny river that feeds into the Liffey near the mouth. And there was an area where the Vikings could bring their ships in, and that was that was called the Black Pool. And so describing Viking Dublin was 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 great fun, and um, there are lots and lots of textbooks about that. Um, and um, it's funny, Neil Price when in his he sent me like four four <coughs> page email with notes and annotations and stuff, and he said. I don't know much about Viking Dublin, but I think this. And I was like, you know way more than I do. <laughs> so if you don't think it's right, I'll go with that. Bless him. He was so kind. Um, and uh, so they, they're in Viking Dublin. They meet Citric Silkbeard. Um, and um, the, I don't know whether you know, Dublin was the largest slave market in Europe at the time. Like we think, you know, we, we Irish think that we, you know, we're great and we never did anything bad to anybody. Well, we had the biggest slave market in Europe. So uh, they were slaves from Ireland, raided from all over Ireland. They were slaves from England. That's people we used to go over and raid England for slaves. And it is recorded there were black slaves for sale in the ninth century. And what I, I know there's a new word that's more politically correct than, than far gurum. Far gurum meaning blue man. The word in Norse for a black person is blaman, which means blue man. And I think that there, that's got to be the Irish. There's got to be an Irish link there. So I, I put, I put a, a, a slave from Africa in there as well. Um, and another thing I did now, 
I have to confess that uh, I, I hoped it might hit a certain vein, but it is accurate. I'll just mention one more bit of history before I, 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 I finish and we do some questions. Um, Archaeology, like all professions until very relatively recently, was dominated by men. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of Viking finds from, from Norway and Sweden. And there's a, a grave from a place called Birka, B-A-R-K-A, -A, uh, that was identified as the grave of a warrior in the 1930s. So skeleton, sword, spear, spears, bow and arrows and axes. You know, a lot of, lot of hardware for one person, man. The archaeologist who was male did not look at the pelvis of the skeleton. You all know that the pelvis of a woman is different in shape to the pelvis of a man. A female archaeologist, uh, with a very long Swedish name that I can't pronounce, in 2017 decided, for whatever reason, she was looking at different skeletons, and she looked at this skeleton, and she went, this is a woman. And... They, everyone tried to discredit her. There were people saying she lied, she changed the bones, she made it up, da, 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 because it literally turned Norse history on its head. Because people had, you've got the Valkyries, who are these, you know, uh, sort of mythical demon women, and there's mentions occasionally of women fighting, but there would never have been any archaeological evidence, as far as I'm aware, until this. And here was a woman buried with war gear. So nobody knows. This is one of the things that annoys me uh, about social media is people then literally, they get one plus one and they get 24. <laughs> All we can say definitely is this was a woman of great importance, buried with weapons. She probably had some kind of military life or training. She may have been a warrior. We don't know. But we, we, all we can say for sure is this is a woman with, with weapons. So what I did was I looked at there's a brilliant book called Never Home, which is about the American Civil War, and that's about all the women who went to war. So there are there are dozens of documented cases of women fighting in the Union Army and the Confederate Army. Now often they were they were following their husbands, but sometimes they were running away from abusive relationships. Sometimes they were transgender. There are multiple accounts of women in the Royal Navy in the British Army during the Napoleonic conflicts, there was a woman surgeon in the British Army who was only found out to be a woman when she died, I believe. So it's not new that women have gone to war. So I put a transgender warrior in there who, if you call her a woman, will chop your head off um, because she's got a real attitude about being called female. I don't know. Um, I just thought, it, you know, I wanted to challenge people because it, it's certainly possible and we've got documentary proof from 200 years ago. National Geographic doesn't normally have articles that are really good for books, but this one did. Um, that's a great book. Um, and these are the kind of historical texts. This is a 120-year-old a, a text, uh, translation, I should say, of a text from the 9th century. It's the War of the Irish against the Vikings, written by a monk in the 9th, 10th century. Um, all the stuff about Brian Boru. And... Um, in my quest for flora and fauna of Ireland at that time, I, can't, I didn't know who to contact. I couldn't find any textbooks. I contacted the Botanical Gardens in Dublin, and the head of the, there told me to get this book. It's, it's amazing. It's like 600 pages about farming in the 900s, written by a monk. And, and it helped me avoid mistakes like I put hay cart. You know, hay cart. You can put a hay cart in any historical novel. You can't. Because the Irish didn't make hay in the 900s. Do you know why? Because the weather was so mild, they didn't need to. They used to leave their cattle out all winter. Um, and then when there was a bad winter, all their cattle died. And in this year, this year, this year, it's recorded that all the cattle died. I learned in this book as well that the Irish didn't have... I had a guy with stirrups. The Irish didn't have stirrups. It was the Vikings brought stirrups. So most of you wouldn't know that when you read the book and you wouldn't care, but they stopped me getting the one-star Amazon review. <laughs> and also, I'm a nerd. I like to get things right. So um, I know I, I could keep talking, but I think I've done about uh, 40 minutes. So um, do you want to stop for a break or do questions first? Or No, I think if you're happy to keep going. Okay. Okay, so so the book the book ends up with him joining a longship and becoming a warrior, learning the warrior's trade uh, with his trusty sidekicks, and they end up raiding Waterford, 
um, going home through Offaly, and they raid Clonmacnoise. I had to do that. <laughs> um, and if you've been to the National Museum of Ireland, you know the the Durnaflan chalices and so on. So I use you know just use descriptions of those of the, the kind of stuff they took. Um, and it, funnily enough, maybe it's because I live in England. The book ends up in England. So he he, uh, he falls in love with Brian Baru's daughter, who was mm -hmm. married off to Citric Silkbeard as part of a peace agreement. Um, and that doesn't go down very well with Citric Silkbeard, unsurprisingly enough. Her name was Clonia, and uh, she was much younger than, than Citric, so unsurprising, really, mm -hmm. an arranged marriage. So he ends up in England, um, and... The ending of the book is left wide open for a sequel, which I'm not currently writing, um, uh, which will probably annoy a lot of my readers. But uh, it was amazing, amazing to write and really great fun to write about Ireland and write about places because they go they go to Monaster Boyce and go on the piss, drink, <laughs> drink, <laughs> drinking the local mead made by the monks. Uh, and they end up in they go through Nauf and pass um, Newgrange and go to Slane. Uh, and then end up in in Mullingar. So there's quite a few places in Louth than me than it. Um, but it was it was it was great fun writing. Um, and uh, I will be back to the guy. Just not sure when. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do now is maybe ans answer a few questions, and then we'll take a break, and we can do some signing of books. And when you come up to to if you want me to sign a book, I'll obviously if you've got any more questions, because usually there isn't enough time to answer all the questions that people have. But anyway. Just put up your hand and we'll go from there. Thank you. Can I start the time? Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned to me the first time I met you that well, one of your future projects was likely to be or could possibly be uh, something based around the Irish Civil War um, and the writing. And I'm wondering, in the context of writing this book, which you say finishes in England, do you have to make a conscious effort not to alienate, given that there's a slight rivalry between Ireland and, and England going back a few years, I think, that, that you don't alienate your English readers when you're writing. And I noticed that the, the English are peripheral figures in the book to a large extent, but they don't come across as the most, either the most ferocious or, or the most noble characters in the book. <laughs> So do do I feel there's any need to uh, worry about English people's sensibilities to do with if I wrote a book about the War of Independence? Um, no, I, no, I don't because I've had enough books out now. And um, so when I wrote a series about Hannibal, the chap who took elephants over the Alps, I had Romans and Carthaginians. I wrote the book from two points of view, and I really liked doing that. And like a lot of people in Ireland, um, I don't know whether you know your family histories or whatever, but I have. I have an ancestor who was in the GPO in 1916, and I have an ancestor who was a British Army officer, home on leave, who was presumably on the beer, because he was from Dublin, but he was in the Gresham Hotel, so maybe he was with a lady or he was, he was on the beer, but he heard the gunshots and went and offered his services, and they said, right here, help, help attack the GPO, and he refused, because he said he wouldn't lead a charge on Irishmen, so the officer said he'd court-martial him, so he gave him his pistol, and he took part in an attack on the GPO without a gun, um, and was shot through the hand and hospital back to the Western Front. It survived and was then warned by the IRA in 1919 to leave, and he went off to Africa and never came back. So I would write the book from both points of view, because I've lived in England for so long now. I was saying, I was saying to Brendan earlier, the English don't know our history. Like they're, they're, they don't, they don't get taught it. They're completely ignorant. Unless a lot of my readers are ex-British soldiers. The guys who served in Northern Ireland, they know what it was like. I've had so many of them say to them, if I hadn't been a British soldier, I would have been on the other side. Um, your average person who wasn't in the military, they haven't got a clue. They literally don't know. So, um, I, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just like us. They just didn't know what was going on. So I have no worries about that at all. Not anymore. I used to. But, okay. yeah, thank you. Francis, did you have a... Well, it's a kind of silly question, maybe, but did the, the term Viking... Was it also used as a, as a verb yes. to go a Viking? Yes. Is, that, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, Viking is, is, is the transitive form of the verb or whatever form. Yeah, it's a vic is, is the word for a person, I think. And a Viking is someone who's going off to, you know, strip people's heads open and take chalices. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, hi. Hi, yeah, I've read some of the Hannibal stuff. It's very good. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. And you kind of answered the question by showing the details you've looked into to get the history yeah you know. but for something like Carthage where everything was destroyed mm -hmm. and a lot of written documentation doesn't exist about it yeah how did you come 
like because it's very specific I, that's what i found quite amazing that it was very specific of how cartage was and how mm -hmm. things are so i'm just wondering how you actually managed to come across material for places that are you know so yeah so the question is that um in my hannibal series i wrote about carthage which was completely destroyed by the romans and and nothing of their civilization remains the romans literally wiped them out of history how did i come about it with great difficulty so there are some textbooks um, and there is partial Roman information and there are some excavations. What's remarkable, and if I ever had the money, um, when, they, when, they, when they erased Carthage, when they knocked it to the ground using humans, not bulldozers, it was a big city built on a hill and they flattened the top of the hill to the size of a modern shopping centre and the rubble from that was rolled down the hills so that they made a, a, a more shallow slope if you bore 90 feet through that rubble, there are complete streets of ancient Carthage still there. What I would give to go down there, but um, very difficult. Uh, and some of the descriptions I used were from later than, uh, they were from the Third Punic War, because we've got a good description of Carthage at that time. Um, but it was, it was, it was hard work. Um, and I had to use some information about the Phoenicians, who were the people who founded Carthage, because we have some information about what they wore, for example. The clothing, that was, that was Phoenician clothing. But I had to sort of do the best I could and, and then make stuff up as well. Which is, but it's got to try and be accurate as well. Yeah, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, hi. Are you going to include Scotland in one, in one of your books? I mean, they, they played a kind of good role in the Roman history, but honestly, I don't think they very... They played a good role in the Viking history because, uh, because most it was mostly England and Ireland got captured by the Vikings and not Scotland. So am I going to write a book about Scotland? I have no immediate plans. I do get emails from my Scottish readers saying, "Oh, will you do this person or that person?" And but I get emails from lots of people saying, "Will you write about this? Will you write?" I've got my one fan in India says, "Will you not write a series about the Mughals?" And I'm like, "Well, I'd love to, but probably nobody would buy it in England." So I, maybe. But one of the annoying things about being a, being a writer is that I always have more ideas than I'll ever have the time to write down. I have got about. 30 ideas in my head and if I live to 84 maybe I'll write them all but <laughs> there'll, be, there'll be probably a hundred more ideas by then so not at the moment but thank you. Is there a question? Yes, hi. I was interested in thinking a story of dialect um, in terms of giving voice to the characters or how the language of that period and the language of the Vikings and the Irish and the, yeah. and the sound and the do I so? Um, do I use dialect and try to give sort of a richness to the books from from how people would have spoken? Yes. I do. Um, it's very difficult because, for example, if you write a book about ancient Rome, they were speaking Latin, and no one would read it. I can't write it. So it's a so the language of historical novels, especially very far back when we don't know how they spoke, mm. is is a completely artificial construct. So you've got to be as faithful as you can without sounding too twee, without using things that are too modern. But I did in this novel, so for example, with the Irish, I used some modern Irishisms, like, come here to me now, and things like that, because although they probably didn't, it makes very different to the way the Vikings spoke. But I also used Irish words, like langfetter, which is a type of hobble that they used on horses, and geron, I used some Irish words. Um, and um, my brother's mother-in-law, she's from Galway, and she told me a couple of years ago uh, when she was growing up, she was from the suburb close to the sea, and the people who were from the near the city centre used to call them herring chokers. <laughs> and fortunately, what they used to call the the people from the city didn't sound good. And, oh my God, herring chokers! So my hero gets called a herring choker by someone else. Yeah who's from Dublin, because he's a coachy. Um, so I, I, I use something like that. So I try. You know, all, uh, the main thing is, as long as I create a difference between the Vikings and the Irish, which I hope I did, but it's still artificial. So for me, I try to do as much research as I can to be as faithful to the sources as I can. And then if you, the reader, thinks you're in that world, whether it's ancient Rome or Viking Anagassan, then I've done my job. But I actually can't be completely accurate because nobody can. Mm. Even the best historian in the world can only theorise, especially about the way people spoke, because spoken language didn't survive. It isn't until the 1800s when we've got letters from ordinary people, you know, from husbands to wives, and 
you know, like the, the people, the letters people sent from Ireland to America and back. Those, those we don't have any of that. We just got a text by a monk about a, a monastery that was sacked. So, so I try my best, um, but who knows if I'm right? <laughs> yes, I. I was just wondering on the research to the Vikings and everything if you maybe came across Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Because the, the game is surprisingly accurate on the history and the background and so on. Uh, so the, have I come across the computer game Assassin's Creed Valhalla? I haven't. I've never got any of those games. It was Rome Total War. Because if I did, I wouldn't be writing novels. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I believe, for example, that the Roman ones are very accurate. Apart from they've got war dogs. Um, but yeah, they're usually quite good. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? I was just wondering... Yeah. Excuse me, what was it like? What's a day in the life of a Viking in Anagassan? Um, it, it would have been basically like, like an Irish person about um, looking after your livestock and making sure you had enough firewood and mm -hmm. repairing clothes and fishing, getting food, mm -hmm. tending your crops, um, looking after your children and you know, making sure your ship was all right in the winter and dragged them out of the water. It would have been very mundane. It's an ordinary life. Just, just yeah. like our yeah. lives are. Yeah. If, you, yeah. if you take out your working mm -hmm. life that's mm -hmm. modern, looking mm -hmm. after your house and feeding mm -hmm. yourself and your animals, whether, yeah. and the pets now, but they would have been, you know, chickens mm -hmm. and, and maybe yeah. pigs and yeah. their sheep. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been very, very mundane. Yeah. What, what I, one of the things I think we, we forget, and I have to sort of think it myself, is... Um, up till very recently, you spent most of your day mm -hmm. trying to heat your house, stay mm. dry, and provide yourself with food. Mm. Yes. Like that yeah. took up many hours mm -hmm. of every day yeah. because yeah. It, there wasn't a tap and there wasn't a supermarket mm -hmm. and there wasn't mm. Amazon to deliver something. Mm. You know, you had to do everything yourself practically. Mm. Yeah. And every, most people could probably make their own, most women could make clothing yeah. Yeah. and most yeah. men could make yeah. shoes yeah. and so yeah. on. So yeah. it was, life was mm. really mm. hard. hard. Yeah. I just remember, I remember um, talking with Michal Mikon once and yeah. he surmised uh, about using Anagassan as a repair base for their damaged ships or something. Yeah, that yeah. I don't know whether, I, I, he was just wondering. Yeah, you know, yeah po possibly. It could yeah, have been somewhere that they, because after so. it was abandoned, it still would have been there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you if you come in and with a ship of 70 warriors, the, mm. the Irish probably aren't going to attack you until they get organized. So if you if you knew that was a safe place to go in with a leaky ship, yeah, yeah quite possibly, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, just, uh, but, yeah. but again... You know, that's just an ordinary. But that's life. that's an yeah. that's a sort of um, what's the word um, a, 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 a theory would make yeah. a reasonable. Yeah. Theory. Oh yeah. 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 Yes. Hi. Thank you. What about religion for the Vikings? Their so, gods uh, today. So I didn't have time to talk about that. By this period, they were largely Christian. But there's a there's a wonderful thing like people you know Tig and Thor Haves, uh, Timothy of the two sides. Um, there are a lot of hammer crosses they found which are sacred to Odin, but also a crucifix. <laughs> <laughs> now, might as well pray to Thor and Odin as well, you know. And I'll, yeah. I'll go to church as well, you know. Um, so, but gods, the, the pagan Vikings, um, one of the things, there's a big difference between Christianity and their paganism was um, the gods, uh, you, there wasn't this thing where you had to be good to, to get the reward. Um, the gods were very, very fickle, particularly Loki, who was a joker, but mm -hmm. they would, you know, if you swore yourself to Odin, you had to die in battle. So mm -hmm. they were, they were, they were terrified of them because everybody was in pagan times. Because one of the main reasons people believed in multiple gods was because they had no understanding. This is what we think is reasonable. Um, why does a storm sink my ship? Why does my crop of wheat get blight and die? Why did my wife die giving birth? Uh, why did why did you know um, I, my son stand on a nail and get lockjaw and die? Mm. Mm. People didn't have an understanding of anything, so everything had a divine origin. I mean, the Romans had hundreds of gods, uh, god and a goddess for everything, mm. and you sort of basically tried to stay on their good side um, by offering them stuff and praying to them, but with no real expectation that they'd help you, because obviously often bad things happened anyway. So yeah, they were. Um, they they were they were uh, yeah quite cool gods in a way because um, they they sort of just got on with life and uh, and you know you could you could you could promise to be good to them that didn't mean anything but they were still 
very much part of Viking life. So, yes, hi. Sorry, That's I'm right. hogging the question. But the, what, interesting, somebody asked me about the, what, a day in the, in the life of a Viking. What's the day in the life of an author like? Yeah. <laughs> 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 do you want the truth? What, what, what do, you want, do you want the truth or, or, the, or the vanilla version? Um, on a good day, so I don't work weekends. I try not to um, because I did as a vet. I worked so many weekends as a vet. I treat it like an office job. I get up. Kids, If the kids are with me, they go to school or whatever. Um, and I have my breakfast. I get online and do social media for a little while, which usually takes way longer than it should do, and reply to emails. Then I start writing, and I write until about 5 o'clock. Um, but if I, I, I keep, I try to keep to a word count every day because the weird thing about being an author is um, I write from January to September. That's my year. Um, and um, my, I don't need to talk to my editor for nine months. So it's like going, there you go, Francis. There's your contract. We'll see you in nine months. <laughs> and no one checks on you. So come September, if I haven't got a book, my editor will go, where's the book? And I go, oh. And they go, no, oh, we're not paying you. Like, they literally don't pay me until I deliver a manuscript and my editor's happy. With, and there's a difference between <laughs> handing it in and editor being happy, believe me. Um, then I get paid when the hardback comes out, and I get paid when the paperback comes out a year later. So I treat it like a desk job. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I put the money from, from payment into the bank and I pay myself a salary. Because once when I got a payment, I was like, oh my God, I got 20 grand. <laughs> Woo! And spent it all. And then I had no money and I wasn't going to be paid again for six months. <laughs> and, like, and you can't go to Penguin Random House and say, hey, can you sub me 20 grand? Because they just go, no, we pay you when you deliver the next book. So I learned very, I had to crack open a savings account I had, luckily. And that never happened again. Um, but then you've got social media and interaction. I have a huge interaction with my readers, a lot of whom are here today, um, friends as well. And um, that takes up a lot of time, but it's, it's all good. Um, I also do, I take people to Pompeii and Herculaneum. I do tours in Italy, a company that's just got, got me to start taking my fans on dedicated trips about my books. I'm starting to do that. I work as a bike guide. I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> but I have cycled over the Alps, a la Hannibal, and I, I do work as an historical guide for a bike company. Um, and uh, I do a lot of talks in schools. So I've walked Hadrian's Wall twice in full Roman gear, including the hobnail boots. Um, and um, I do talks in schools that teach Latin. And I dress as a Roman soldier and I talk about life in ancient Rome. And kids today are so easy to shock. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> Young kids, you talk about poo a lot, and they laugh. And the older ones, you just tell them about all the ways the Romans used to kill people. And they just sit there like this. <laughs> so it's good fun. It beats being a vet. Thank you. Yes, sir? You mentioned monasteries quite a lot. And most of the records that we have at that time were written by monks. Correct. I was thinking the ones in Georgia that wrote about the Black Death. Yeah. And it was just silent because they'd obviously all died. But how difficult it is, is it for historians to dig beyond the monks' perhaps slightly slanted writing yeah. and the religious to get an accurate picture? Great question. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Great question. So, for example, a text like this or a text written by the monks you mentioned which is often the only documentation we have from an historical period. How do we get past their obvious slant? Well, historians, um, people only started being really interested in ancient history in the 17 and 1800s. Before that, nobody really cared. And they used to just accept what was written down and take it completely verbatim. All the Roman stuff, well, Nero must have been vile because this man said he was. When, of course, And it's only in the last... 50, 40, 30, 20 years, um, historians and archaeologists have started being a lot more critical and analytical and going, well, this other tiny excerpt of text says something different. So is he completely wrong and that guy's completely right or is perhaps that guy exaggerating mm -hmm. or whatever? So it's, it's incredibly difficult, especially when you've only got one source about a particular mm -hmm. thing. You can't really be. But when you sometimes have texts that are sometimes copies of that text or compilations of that text and another text. And you you know, people spend years of their lives, academics, going, well, this paragraph and this line. And so it's very difficult uh, to be accurate. The life of Alexander the Great, written 100 years after his death. How accurate was it? Was the guy a supporter of Alexander or, or what? You know? So a lot of the Roman histories are the equivalent of you 
writing a book about the Battle of Waterloo, which was in 1815. Mm. Well, what do you know? No, you probably do. But they say, what do you know about the Battle of Waterloo? Well, you don't. But because it's now 2,000 years later, you're going, oh, well, it must be. Yeah. Yeah, it's still true, um, but it's when sometimes it's all you've got. You've just got to you've just got to take it, um, and maybe water mm. it down a bit. So one of the things that's very common in Roman texts is we killed two hundred thousand British right, when Boudicca's rebellion was crushed. Mm. Okay, let's divide that by two. No, four. No, <laughs> yeah, it was probably forty thousand, but it was obviously massive. But it, two hundred. It's nuts. Yeah. So thank you. Any other questions? So how, the, how, how does the shaman work? How does the... Shaman work. Does he use runes or do they work? Uh, how does the shaman work? Um, they had a, a wand, uh, an iron rod, and they found quite a lot of them. And it was a sort of a semi-sexual object that he used to sort of writhe around the, from yeah. descriptions. Um, and indeed, some of the shamans that survived in the Sami Lap uh, yeah. in Finland and, and, up until, and in, um, from tribes in Siberia using similar things. They used to have um, uh, a bag with things like birds' feathers and, and bones from animals in it as well. They, when, they, when they did their magic, they were on a low dais or platform in front of people, um, and, and they made spells, and they talked to fetches or ghosts. They communed with the dead, supposedly. And they could cast spells. Mm. I mean, I've got a spell in the book that is literally word for word the spell that a shaman used on somebody. Um, they must have, you know, they were they were presumably quite good con artists as well. Um, but people believed in that type of stuff, and presumably the best, the better ones were were just very good at it, and didn't make too outlandish a claim, because then they go, "You said that, and it didn't happen, so I'm going to kill you." <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, they did. They did use bones with runes on them as well. Yeah. Sorry, you asked. That. I didn't answer that. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To predict the future. So, anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I I I know you did books about the Romans, but what about after the Romans, the Holy Roman Empire, the fall of Rome? <laughs> So I'm writing, have, the, have I done books of after the Romans? I'm writing one about the sack of Rome in 410 AD, which is the latest I've ever gone. They're all on the list. They're on this big long list. <laughs> Seven <laughs> Years' War in America, Irish War of Independence, Cromwell, World War One. Yeah, there's just so many places I want to write about. Yes, hi. Uh, this isn't really a question, it's more a statement. But um, we were at a history talk in Latin about six months ago, and it was this local man who was fascinated with round towers and we were always told that round towers were built for the monks to store their gold when the Vikings came. Yeah. So he has looked at every round tower in Ireland and Scotland yeah. and he has measured every single one of them. Okay. And from every window of every round tower in all of that area, it's exactly six miles to the next one. So uh -huh. he believes that mm -hmm. it was they were built as a way of warning it's why the Romans because never got into Ireland because they would warn each other and the distance if you light a fire from on the east coast to the west coast it would take 34 minutes to the west coast to find wow. wow. so he went all the academics and he said this is what I believe and they said oh, that's just chance <laughs> <laughs> doesn't, doesn't sound like chance that's, I haven't heard that, that's very exactly. interesting um, it's 6 miles is 5 Irish miles yeah one th another thing I'll quickly mention about Ireland, one of the things I loved, which is in the book. So in my earlier books, I had mentioned of time in hours, and I really wish I hadn't because, you know, when, when all you had was um, um, a sundial in a town and you didn't live in a town, there was morning, mid-morning, noon, early afternoon, mid-afternoon, darkness, night. That was all you knew. You didn't know anything else. In medieval times, if there was a church nearby, when the bell rang, you knew what time it was. Nobody had a clue what time it was. So there's no mention of time really in this book. But what I loved most about Ireland at this time was the longest measurement of distance in Ireland in the 9th and 10th centuries was a spear cast. Mm -hmm. They had one inch, two inch, three inch, four inch, four, up to a spear cast. And then it, that was it. And I thought that's actually how small most people's worlds were. Most people never went more than two or three miles. So, mm -hmm. so it's just like three or four spear casts or it's quite a long walk. I don't know how long it's going to take. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because he went to the different round towers, yeah. and you can see from one 
I would I would completely challenge him on that's why the Romans didn't take Ireland though. <laughs> the Romans, the Romans, if the Romans, sad as it is to say as an Irishman, if the Romans had come over to Ireland, they would have kicked the living daylights out of them. Anyone from Scotland here? They go, oh, the Romans never conquered Scotland. Yes, they did. They went up there, trashed them. Mons Graupius, which is above Inverness at the top, they killed 30,000 tribesmen in one day. And then they went, midges, no gold, no lead, no silver. Troops were needed on the Rhine, back down to England. <laughs> Agricola famously stood in southwest Scotland, saw Northern Ireland. It's one of the only, one of the only references to Ireland in Roman texts, apart from the, 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 the dogs, the war dogs, hunting dogs from Ireland were brilliant. Um, but he stood and looked at Northern Ireland and said, I could take that with one legion and 5,000 auxiliaries. My version of that is they hit the Bushmills distillery when they landed. <laughs> they all got completely bladdered. The local Irish slaughtered them. And that's why the Romans never <laughs> conquered Ireland. Another lost legion. Another lost legion, yeah. <laughs> so I think, do we need to... No, I think I just I just wanted to say personally thank you to everybody for coming tonight. I enjoyed it immensely. I hope you did too. Um, ben now, as you know, is an author and needs to sell books, so we have them up here at the table. I just wanted one last question, and then we could finish up. If that armchair behind you was a time machine, and you've you've done Napoleonic, you've done Roman, you've done Vikings, any period in history, when would you go back? Have I got safe return? Definitely safe return. Because <laughs> if yeah, there's no yeah. safe return, I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> As if it was if, uh, Rome, Rome yeah. in the first century AD when it was a million people and you did. But I, it's funny, all the things that I write about, I don't want to see gladiator games. I don't want to see the battles I write about because they would be, they would just be, I'd like yeah. to see the, the massive bathhouses and the markets and, you know, the Senate or whatever, one of the big temples and so on. But, yeah. Sorry, Ben. Yes. When you're writing these wonderful battle sequences, do you visualize it? Can you see them in cinema? Yeah. Would you like to be filmed? Would I like to Would be? Would you like? Um, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there's a, someone in America sniffing at the door of a book I wrote about that Pompeii. Be, be. And <laughs> there's, the negotiations yeah. are happening. I'm not allowed to say anything, yeah, but there's, for the first time ever, there's negotiations. It's a book I co-wrote with some Americans yeah. um, about Pompeii. And that could be, book. yeah. It's the first time anything like that's ever happened. So, mm. absolutely, sure. What? I know one person <laughs> whose really book, was, book was in Cannes last year as a film, and I hadn't seen her. And I said, I said, Liz, oh my God, oh congratulations. What was it like? And she said, Oh my God. I said, I read that it wasn't like your book. And she said, I didn't care. I was sitting there and sitting there going, That's my book. That's my book. <laughs> Very honest answer. Yeah. involved with the cast. Yeah. If you know old friends that are after. <laughs> All the extras you need are so, here tonight. I have a friend who's one of his novels nearly got made an, Ar an Ar King Arthur novel and uh, Netflix bought it and the only reason it didn't get made was because of the actors strike or last oh. year literally it was about to be made and I used to say I just go Giles fat middle aged man in pub in the background <laughs> and he's like everybody I know is asking me that I can't promise it So, but I, I should just say thank you to Tom and Mark and, and everyone in the staff here and you know, it's use it or lose it. Amazon is coming to Ireland next year and small stores, whether they're mm. vegetable shops or butchers mm. or bookshops, they're part of your, you, you know, of your town's life. And events like this really help bookshops, uh, but so does coming in and, and buying a book. And just because something might be two euros or three euros more than it is on Amazon, mm -hmm. that two or three euros is paying the wages of the person that mm. you're talking to. And personal recommendations in a bookshop you know, are way better than you'd get um, off Amazon's recommendation page. So, um, you know, please do support your, because I know a lot of you don't live around here, but do, do, do try and support your indies because they're, they're really important. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that, Ben. Much appreciated. I sort of think that we're a bit like um, Asterix and Amazon are like the Romans. So we, we, hold, <laughs> we hold our little corner of, of Ireland against them. But I, I think that's true and much appreciated. So listen, thanks everybody to, to Ben. <laughs> The number of people that are here, and I know a lot of you know Ben and wouldn't have seen him in a while, just to be conscious that there will be other people behind you in the queue. There'll be plenty of time when the books have been sold and signed. We're not kicking anybody out yeah, anytime I'm not early. Rushing, not rushing away. Or anything. Ben's hanging around for a while, so there'll be plenty of time to chat and catch I've up. I've got a sleeping bag to sleep on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did have one lady in a few weeks ago who you visited while you were on your early veterinary experience. Oh, yeah. She said you arrived in after being out with a, a pregnant cow all if that's the right term, 
all night and she said how did it go and you, you sort of shrugged out of the sleeping bag and said I don't know I fell asleep after a few minutes. <laughs> well, that was when I was supposed to be um, seeing a cow calf when I was a student and yeah. I slept in the barn but I, I didn't stay awake and she calved while I was asleep. <laughs> so we have a sleeping bag at the back for you if you need it later on. Anyway thanks again folks and uh, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Send your happy. <laughs>